Pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, I just found out, if you didn't know, Sherry and I are, for the very first time, grandparents. We just, we are, yeah. So I got to get used to saying the grandkids thing. Sherry actually had the opportunity to meet him and uh, held him uh, because she, my folks, um, they're in their 80s and Sherry flew, she had the week off, so she was able to fly uh, and help them get home in the Seattle area. Well, and there they drove to Idaho. And then my son lives down in Oregon, six hours south, and so she was able to drive down there and meet her brand new uh, grandbaby boy. And so, cute guy. And so, anyways, I just want to say that, because even though, I mean, you know, I don't know, I can't wait to see him in person myself. So, um, can we all stand? We are um, going to pray. And if you can remain standing, we'll read from God's Word together. Let's pray. Father God, you're an awesome God. Lord, we fall down before you right now. We worship you. We've been worshiping you already. Lord, it's neat to think about what Jesus did for us. And because of Jesus, and like we shared in communion, because of your grace from what Jesus did, we now have right standing before you. And now we're honored to get into your word and to learn more from you. Your word is truth. It's power. It's strength. It's wisdom. It gives us meaning and purpose. So direct us today, Lord. Help us to hear you today. Make your word be as it already is, alive for us. Uh, help us to hear and obey. We thank you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be reading from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Thank you. You may be seated. Today's message is called Living Last Day Lives by Loving Like Jesus Loves. Uh, we've been in a series called Living Last Day Lives uh, where we've looked at various scriptures that describe what it's going to look like before Jesus returns. And we've been also looking at different things happening around us and saying, hey, more and more it looks like what we're seeing it looks a lot like what we're seeing here. Pretty amazing, isn't it? In fact, I, I was uh, blown away um, we, when, uh, we're driving, Sherry and I, I'm trying to remember, it was actually to, to church this morning. And there's a little sign, it's a little wired sign like we had for our Easter. And it said, Bible prophecies are coming true. Amen. It's true, isn't it? Yes. It is. And so, more and that's kind of what we've been focusing on, isn't it? But also... How should we live in light of the fact that Jesus is coming soon? What is, well, how does he want to find us? What does he want us to be, look like when he comes back? How, how can I be what he wants me to be when he shows up? Or, or, or in preparation for his coming back. Now, now, last week, we took a little detour because it was Easter, but not really. I'm going to show you. This is, today is actually kind of like a part two from last week, and we'll talk about that in a second. But before that, what we've been doing is we've been looking at the Scriptures and trying to find out different characteristics. We've been devoting a partic uh, to different characteristics each week that say how we should live in light of Christ's return. And so we've looked at a number of things, like we looked at in Second Timothy, and we were there a number of weeks, three and four, about one, what the place is going to look like, the world's going to look like before he comes back, and it says it's going to be pretty corrupt. Well, we've been seeing that. It also said that people are going to start turning away from the Bible and chase after myths. Well, we've seen that too, haven't we? But it said, you believers, though, we, ourselves, we must continue to be devoted to this. Preach the word in season and out of season. Remember that? And so we need to be people who are not going to compromise the word regardless of people, other people, are turning away from it. 
We also learned about the importance of, of having a perspective of uh, having a clear mind, which means being, having a resolute heart to continue to move forward for the Lord and doing what's right, yeah, even when it's kind of a challenging uh, situation. And that went into our next week, which was we have to be so devoted to Jesus that even if it means we have, are persecuted for our faith, we got to stand firm because the Bible says, Jesus himself said, at some point before he comes back, he said, all the nations will hate you because of me. Folks, we're starting to see that too, aren't we? Even in our own country. Amen? We are. Now, people don't want to admit it, and then if anyone says that, well, we're considered crazy. Well, okay, whatever. We can see it. And so how, and, and the Bible says we got to still remain firm and keep going. Then we looked at the importance of, uh, two weeks ago, but of remaining passionate in prayer. We, we talked about the importance of, of uh, praying today like Jesus is coming tomorrow. And we also said the value, and the, the value of prayer is that it helps change our nope, that is our doubts and our fears, to hope. Remember that? Prayer helps change my nope to hope. And our last week, because it was Easter, we looked at the whole, uh, why Jesus even went through all that he went through for us. Why did he even do that? Why did he go through all that? And, and all the agony and the torture. And of course the answer was simple. It's because he loves us that much. Because of love. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And this morning I'm going to, we're going to, Consider this like a part two, because if, if Jesus went through all that for us, the question is, and this goes into what an ex, another quality God wants us to have in pre pre preparation for Christ's return is, well, how should I respond back to him? If he responded in love in that way to me, the Bible wants me to love him back. And the way I love him back, he says, a key way is to love other people. And so we're going to talk about that. Needing to love and return. We're going to talk about how we are to love like Jesus loved. Loving others is a key characteristic God wants to see in our life before he returns. So today we're going to talk about what it means to love like Jesus loves. And then we're going to provide a couple ways on how we can do that. There's a young teenage boy and girl. They were sitting on a swing in their parents, her parents, on the front porch. They lived up in the mountains of North Carolina. And they spent a lot of time there, away from everyone, just the two of them, particularly on Friday nights. They talk about all kinds of things, uh, things about what they'd want to do when they grew up. For example, they'd want to go away to college, and if they did, that means they'd have to move away from home and get enough money to, do, to go and to do that. And for him, that meant getting a job or maybe going into the military and get some good job training. And they asked, they talked about, Should we, do we want to have a family? And together they talked about that as well. Every Friday evening was the same. Uh, the young man would uh, talk, you know, he'd talk to her. He, he, he'd come each week. Loved to be with her, but he also was also inspired by his mo her mom's cooking. That was another reason to come. <laughs> and whenever he got ready to leave, each time he would hold her hand and tell her that he, uh, he'd missed her, but he looked forward to seeing her next Friday, and he gave her a hug. But this particular Friday night, he's feeling a little bit more tender toward her. So he hugged her, and then he declared from the bottom of the porch stairs, you know, I love you so much, I'd fight the biggest man. I'd swim the deepest ocean. I'd climb the highest mountain just to be with you, because I love you so much, nothing would ever stop me from being with you. He then kissed her for the first time. He turned, around, he turned around to leave, and looking back as he opened the gate, he said to her, you know, I'll see you next Friday if it doesn't rain. <laughs> we can say we love sacrificially, but it's not always easy to work that out, is it? <laughs> Our key passage today, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, the context is verse 7. And Peter was talking about, and we looked at this two weeks ago, he, start, he declares the end of the world is coming soon. And of course, and with that means Christ's return. And, and Christ would bring about judgment in the world and anything. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. 
He's, but he said, because it's ending soon, we should, and he said, he said we should be devoted to prayer. And we talked about that two weeks ago. But then, verse 8, he says, he said the most important thing you should do in lieu of the fact that Christ returns coming soon, and that's this, and we read it already. He said, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. He tells us that our love for each other is the most important thing of all. When it comes to being prepared for Jesus' return, God says through Peter that the most important thing you can do is love other people. And then he tells us why. He said this, for love covers over a multitude of sins. Now what does he mean by that? He means that our love for others will help us overlook the offenses that we suffer from them. If I love them, the more I love them, the easier it'll be to overlook stuff that gets that it w could anno annoy me otherwise, right? And there's a lot, a lot to talk about love in 1 Corinthians 13, and you know, and one of the one of the issues, one of the descriptions is where it's not easily irritated, it's not easily irritable. We forgive. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love helps us to forgive and extend a lot of grace. That's what Jesus does for us, right? His grace, again, we've already talked about that today, His grace extends to us because His love is so great. It says in, uh, well, I'll read this one scholar, his name is uh, T.R. Schreiner, he said this, when believers lavish love on others, the sins and offenses of others are overlooked. And our love helps us to overlook the sins of other people and their weaknesses, etc. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12 says this, Hatred stirs up quarrels, but love makes up for all offenses. Do you sometimes wrestle with forgiving others like you should? Especially when they hurt you bad badly? Or maybe they hurt someone else you love and hurt, you hurt, they hurt them badly, and so then it's hard for you not to be upset or even resentful toward the other person. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I can relate to that. A while back, I found myself having a difficult time not real, being really angry with a, a relative. And I, if I wasn't even, maybe even a bit bitter, I had to fight bitterness because they hurt a close family member of mine very deeply. I watched it. And it was happening over a period of time. And they didn't just hurt them. They hurt others as well. Other people were getting offended by this relative quite often. Now, I also knew this relative was oblivious to it. Uh, that they were to deny it. They, they were kind of brazen. Maybe we'll just call it, we'll just call it maybe a blind, they were, it was a blind spot for them. We'll be gracious and say it that way. But regardless, even if it was brought to their attention, they probably would deny it. But they had hurt people, including a very close relative, friend, well, family member of mine. And it hurt me to see them suffer. Nonetheless, this family member had to forgive them and did. And I knew I needed to do the same thing. Right? Of course. And so I, it was a process, but it, it did. And sometimes every now and then I have to come and do a re-forget. Oh, you're fine a little bit. Oh, yeah, okay, forgive, forgive, okay. It wasn't always easy, though. I think sometimes the harder the pain, the harder to forgive. But we read in our scriptures here that love covers over a multitude of sins, doesn't it? The more love, the more I'm able to to forgive. <clears throat> now, love helps me to forgive no matter what. And it does the same thing for you. Jesus was that way, right? We talked, we, last week we talked about his love for us and what he did for it. Let's look at some examples where Jesus' love helped him to forgive or overlook the offense of others. Oh, let's go through a few examples. For example, when the religious leaders and Pharisees brought that woman who was caught in adultery, right? At the temple. Jesus was teaching in the temple. John chapter 8. And you know the story. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. 
She's caught in adultery. You always wonder, why didn't they bring the guy too? That was, they didn't care about the woman. She was their pawn. She was collateral damage. Didn't matter to them. They were trying to trap Jesus. And, you know, should we stone her or not? The law of Moses says we should, but of course, since, since uh, Judea was over, was under Roman rule, law and law, Roman law didn't allow capital of punishment. They thought they had Jesus over a barrel. And of course, you know, Jesus said, well, you who were up without sin, cast the first stone. Throw the first stone. Well, they all had sinned. And everyone dropped the stones and walked away. Now, there was still somebody there with her. And that one person had never sinned. <laughs> Jesus Christ, right? He asked her where, uh, where accusers were. And she said, there are none, Lord. And she said, he said, neither do I accuse you. But go and sin no more. <laughs> Jesus forgave her. And he was the one that could have thrown the first stone. But he didn't. His love covered her multitude of sins. And that's how he wants to be with us. A similar situation happened a little bit another time. Jesus was invited to a Pharisee's home named Simon. And, and while he was there, this woman said, who had a bad reputation... I came and sat behind Jesus because they reclined the table, so they're laying, laying on the side. And she washed his feet with her tears because she's crying over her sin. She's ashamed of her sin. The Bible does not exam to tell us exactly what her bad reputation was. She could have been a prostitute. She could have just been an adulteress. Who knows? But she had a rep... It was, a no it was an immorality issue, but that's all we know. And so... She's doing that. Meanwhile, she's wiping her tears off of his feet with her hair and she has this really expensive perfume bottle and she's pouring, she's pouring this beautiful, this wonderful perfume over his feet and Jesus is allowing the whole thing. And the Simon, the host, said, he's thinking in his mind, you know, if she, Jesus knew who this was, he wouldn't be allowing this to happen. But Jesus knew, knew everything, and he also knew his thoughts. See, Jesus knew Simon's thoughts. He said, you know, Simon, he started asking him a question, and by the bottom line is, Jesus made a point. He says, you know, he who forgives much loves much, but he who forgives little loves little. And then he said, this woman here, her sins are many. But she's forgiven, and she loves much. And then he turned to her and said, your sins are forgiven. She went away happy. His love for her, even though he knew her reputation better than Simon, his love covered a multitude of her sins. That's what love does. Jesus doesn't stand far removed, folks, from us because of people's sins or our sins. He, 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 Jesus goes to them. <laughs> Do we, have we ever thought about this? Think about this. It says in Isaiah chapter 53 that all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the sin of us all, the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Prophecy about Jesus, what Jesus did 750 years later. We all turned away. We all went different ways. But God caused our sin to go on him. What does that mean? While we turn away from God, God came to us. He pursued us. He chased us. Jesus coming to earth is God chasing us. Every time you mess up, you want to run from him a lot of times. We want to run from him, but he comes to us. He chases after us. Adam and Eve blew it. They ran and they hid themselves, didn't they? But Jesus says, but God went after him. Adam, Adam, where are you? God chases us when we're the ones who sinned. Now, I mean, think about that for a moment. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff, Amen. I mean, don't you want God to pursue you? His love covers our multitude of sins. And remember, even when Christ was on the cross, you know the deal. They're all heaping abuses on him and mocking him and even spitting on him. And Soldiers are throwing dice, casting lots, throwing dice basically for his clothes. He's still alive. They don't care. He's going to be dead soon. Hey, which one? Do you want his? Do you want this? Do you want this? Like grave digger kind of bad. What's going on there? And what is Jesus' response? You know what he said. 
Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. The thief on the cross, right? They'd both been heaping abuses on Jesus. That included the thief that asked for help at first. But then he got a pinch in heart. Jesus. We got, well, he said, hey, we're getting what we deserve. But Jesus, when you, please remember me when you enter your kingdom. But well, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus' love covers our multitude of sins. And he does that today. See, he still, his love still covers a multitude of sins. We bank on it, folks. We bank on it. That's why we take communion and remember, we confess, we know it's forgiven, right? We bank on his grace that's greater than all of our sin. Amen? We bank on it because it's true. We bank on it because it's true. His love covers our multitude of sins. He asked us now to be the same way as he is with us. It says in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I've loved you, you should love one, each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Jesus is saying that he wants us to love each other and, and people in general in the same way that he loves us. Well, we've already looked at a number of examples of how Jesus loved. I mean, he loved sacrificially. He loved to the cross. And he's asking us to be the same way. Yes, he is. I, he said, I want you to love the same way I'm loving you. And then he went and died for him. Amen? Amen? And he wants us to be the same way. You know, we don't, we talk about the importance of love. Because it is. Two greatest commandments. All, both are based on love. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love, love, love. But do we know what that really means? It means to love like Jesus loved. Self-sacrificially. Well, that's not easy to do, is it? If we're honest about it. How do we do that? How do we love like Jesus loved? Self-sacrificially. I think it goes back to the, our key model as a church. What's, do you remember what our motto is at church? Our little slogan? Our little purpose statement? Well, that's true. That's a different one. That's true, brother. You're on the right track. Remember? Letting God love us and love others through us. You ever seen that before? Look at the cover of your program right now. <laughs> it's there every single week. <laughs> Letting God love us and love others through us. Amen? That's it. Now, I, you know what? Have we ever said that together? Let's say it together on the count of three. Okay? One, two, three. Letting God love us and love others through us. That's really what this is saying. First of all, we need we, we to let God love us, and we'll talk about that. And we'll need to let him love others through us. But you know what? It sounds good, but what does that actually mean? How do I love others better? How do I love like Jesus loves? It's a great question. And it actually goes, and believe it or not, our little slogan has the answer for that. And we're going to focus our time on answering that question. How do I love like Jesus loves? How do I love like Jesus loves? Now, there's two main points here, but we're going to have a couple of sub points in there along the way as well. But there are two main points of how do I love like Jesus loves. First one, oh, by the way, if you don't know, there should be a fill in the blanks in your little program there if you'd like to do that. Kind of helps to write things out. How do I love like Jesus loves? One, I need to constantly draw closer to Christ. I need to constantly draw closer to Christ. This is from Jesus' own words. John 15, 4 and 5. Remain in me, Jesus is talking, and I'll remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, the reason I said in our little point here about to constantly draw closer to Christ is because that word remain. 
And the New American Standard Translation uses the word abide. It means to hang tight, remain close, press in, and just stay there. And that's what Christ is saying we need to do with Tim. We need to press in, hang tight, draw closer, and just hang there, stay there. Remain in Him, abide in Him. It needs to be a constant thing then of constantly drawing closer to Him. Um, and you know, if you think about it, that um, we, we're talking about loving other people like Jesus loves. Here's the deal. If we want to love like Jesus, we need to be closer to Him. The more, the more we press into Jesus' love and remain in His love for us, that we're going to hang and tight, hang tight with Him, he, we're going to find that He's going to love others through us. The tighter we are with Christ, the brighter our love for others will be. The tighter with Christ, the brighter our love. Can you say that with me, please? The tighter with Christ, the brighter our love. Let's say that again. One, two, three. The tighter with Christ, the brighter our love. Or simply, the tighter, the brighter. The tighter I'm with Jesus, the more I'm abiding with Him, the brighter my love's going to shine out. And, he, and, and Jesus talked about this. He said, he's saying the whole point. He said, you know what? He said, if we remain in Him, press tight in Him, we're going to bear His fruit. We're going to bear much fruit, he even said. Now, I think it's significant when we talk about bearing fruit. What do we mean by bearing fruit? Now, we, obviously, the first part is bringing people to know Jesus Christ, right? Making disciples, right? That's the first thing, and I agree with that. Absolutely. That's the, we're called. That's our commission. But it's not just bringing people to Christ. We're going to bear fruit also by basically our life will start showing the characteristics of the Holy Spirit in our life, right? The fruit of the Spirit, the Bible calls it. In Galatians chapter 5. Now, I, I think it's interesting if we think about it. Do you happen to remember that it describes nine qualities of the fruit of the Spirit in that passage of Galatians 5, 22 and 23? Do you remember what the first quality is of that fruit of the Spirit? What is it? Love. Yeah, <laughs> right there. <laughs> They're ahead of me. Yes, right there. We're going to be there in a second. Absolutely. Love. Let's go ahead and look at that since you're looking at it right now. Galatians 5.22. It says this. And it goes into 23 as well. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Love is the first fruit mentioned among the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you think about it, so we're thinking, okay, if we're going to bear much fruit, Jesus said, how? By remaining tight with him, hanging, pressing in, and drawing closer to him on a constant basis. Dwelling there, just dwelling tighter and tighter and not letting go. That's abiding and remaining. And he said, when we do that, we're going to bear much fruit. And if you think about it, a key aspect of that fruit is love. So, here's the deal. If I want to share, uh, emit the fruit of the Spirit in my life, a key aspect of that being love, I need to be tight with Jesus because it's from that, it's through His Spirit, that love actually shines. The tighter I am with Christ, the brighter my love shines out. His love shines out through me. Right? So, okay, well, how do I do that? It's not easy. The tighter we are with Christ, the brighter our love will be. The tighter, the brighter. Now, we said we need a love like Jesus loves. We need to draw close. So, okay, here's the question. And if, 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 we're, if the more we're tighter with Him, the more the love's going to shine through us, we have to be tighter with Him, then the brighter our love will be. That's what this is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. We can't do it on our own. He's saying that, right? So what stops us? What hinders us from drawing closer to Christ? Why don't I draw closer to Christ sometimes? Why do I not draw closer to Him? Let's look at a couple reasons. Let's give two reasons. One, because I don't let Him love me in some key way. I don't let Him love me in some key way. Folks, it can sound selfish letting God love me. That sounds so selfish. You know what? Here's the deal. I'm going to share a scripture with you, and then I want you to own what we're talking about, right? 
Do you remember when Jesus, when he's at the Passover meal, remember he stripped down and he washed the disciples' feet? John chapter 13. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Remember Peter said, oh, no, no, Lord, I can't have you do that. I don't deserve that. No, 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 no. I'll wash your feet. And remember what Jesus said to Peter? Hey, if I, you don't let me this, ha if you don't let me do this, you'll have, you have no part in me. That's deep stuff. In other words, you have to let me love you, Pete. Before you can love others, you need to let me love you. Deep, huh? You got the little child, the little grandchild. You know the situation. You're on the airplane. What do they say? First person you give the mask to is who? Yourself. Why? Because you won't be able to help them if you haven't helped yourself. And then when you help yourself, then you can better help them, right? First, if we want God's love to shine through us, we need to be tied with God first ourselves. And if we're to do that, we have to let him love us. And that's hard sometimes. People don't do that. Uh, look at John chapter 15, verse 4. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Hey, you're trying to do this on your own, and you're not being very successful at it, are you? Right? First, we need to get tight with Jesus. First, we need to let him love us so we can better let him love others through us. Look at Luke chapter uh, 13, verse 34. This is a powerful verse. I'm always amazed by this passage. Jesus, at this passage, he's overlooking coming into Jerusalem, and he's, he's acting at this point as who he is, but he's revealing who he really is, which is God Almighty. And he pours out this lamentation over Jerusalem. The, the people that he loved as God Almighty. Let's read this. It says, Luke 13, 34. It says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jesus is talking, but he's talking as God. The city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. Look at this. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. You wouldn't let me love you. And because of it, you're on your own. You got what you wished. God, throughout, if you know this history, his people would come close to him and they would abandon him. They'd come close to him and they would abandon him. And how often he would say, I just wanted you to hang tight so I could protect you and care for you. And you wouldn't have it. <coughs> you wouldn't let me love you like I, you needed and I wanted to. They wouldn't let God love them. And guess what? We can do the same thing, can't we? We can be the same. We, we can be just like the, the Jews in Jerusalem. Why? How? Well, maybe because I'm ashamed about something I've done, and so I don't go fully to him about it. It could be a sin habit or a weakness. Maybe I have an addiction that I'm not willing to surrender to him yet, or something that I think I can overcome on my own. Or like, maybe I want, just an example, I want to lose weight, and so I'm committed to doing this on my own. I don't want to bug God about this. It seems too trivial. Uh, so I'll do this one on my own. People talk about that a lot, but do they give it to God in the process? Or maybe I have some necessary project that needs to be done around the house, but it's just lingering and it's not getting done and, and because I haven't even thought about including God in it. We're doing so much in our life where God's not a part of it. Think about it. Maybe I have a real problem that I'm worried about and I'm ashamed of it. I don't know how to depend on God for help with this. So I don't. I just continue to struggle with it on my own. I'm not letting God love me through it. I haven't let God intervene. In critical ways. God wants to be included in every aspect of our lives, whatever it is. We need to draw closer to Jesus and let his love shine through us to help us and not struggle on our own. 
AA's key point is we can't do it on our own. We need a higher power because we are, we are helpless on our own to do this. That's the first of the 12 steps. Powerless is the phrase they use. Then they talk about surrendering to a higher power. And we know that Jesus Christ is that higher power. Amen? Amen. So, hence, but the truth is then we need to go and run to him and let him love us and help us do it so then we can then let, let him love others through us. But before we can let him love others through us like he, we want him to and we, as we need him to, we have to first go to him for ourselves. We're not letting him love us like we need. We're trying it on our own. And so we struggle on our own. And we don't have the victory that we want. And then we blame God because we don't understand. Oh, really? You didn't include him in it. Another reason why I don't run to God and stay tight with him like I should. And that is I erect and keep barriers between God and me. Matthew chapter 19, it's kind of similar, but different too. Matthew 19, 21 and 22 said this. Jesus told him, the rich young ruler, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. The young man allowed his worth, his wealth, excuse me, to be a barrier between him and Jesus. And so he didn't pursue being tighter with him. He came up to a certain level, but then something got in there he was unwilling to give up, so he walked away. And do we do that ourselves? Okay, God, I want to follow you so far so to a particular uh, level, but all of a sudden you ask, oh, I'm not giving that up, so we pull away. So we don't ultimately draw as close as we could. And so we're not letting him love us like he could and help us like he could. Nothing's worth putting up a barrier between us and Jesus. In the Old Testament, the southern kingdom of Judah had good kings and bad kings. They had some phenomenal kings and some really rotten kings. And they had a good number of kings that were good but not great. You know, they had the spectrum. I want to talk about the good, maybe even close to great, but not phenomenally great. They had something that would hinder them. Like even a really good king, like King Jehoshaphat. Sorry, I guess I'm doing whatever that is. All right, I'll just keep preaching and you keep listening to the crackle. <laughs> but King Jehoshaphat, he did a lot of good things. He eliminated some of the altars and stuff that were from foreign gods. But like other kings before him, he didn't take away the altars that were on the hills surrounding Jerusalem. The high places that Solomon originally erected, actually. Look at me at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 32 and 33. Jehoshaphat was a good king following the ways of his father Asa. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. So he's, doing really, he's a really good king here. During his reign, however, here's a however. He failed to remove all the pagan shrines, and the people never fully committed themselves to follow the God of their ancestors. They only came to a certain level. They didn't fully let God love them because they put the barrier. They didn't to totally take away all the barriers between this, them and God. And he was a really good king, Jehoshaphat was. But we can't allow any barrier to stand between us and the Lord, and he still allowed some. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the second part of it said, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And it does! Even as believers, it still does! Amen! Come on, it still does! I still blow it! And then it's like, okay, Lord, how can I learn from this? Because I think, thank you that your grace forgives me, but I don't want to abuse your grace. So how, am I be, how can I be better next time? How can I strip myself of this? Because I want to honor you in every way. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We have to strip it away, whatever it might be. We have all our reasons, all these reasons, uh, help us, well, unfortunately, so that we don't let God love us like we should. We put up our barriers. We still have our high places. Maybe we follow God in many different ways. We're trying to, and other, you know, trying to be a good believer. We're saved. We're going to heaven. We're doing good in many ways, but we still have some high places we haven't let ourselves be rid of. Amen? Yeah, that's right. 
And if we really want to let God love us in every way and let Him love others through us, we have to get rid of those high places too. Well, how can I draw closer with Christ? We're just going to give you two quickies here. First, I need to receive Him. I can't, I can't get past this one, folks. Can't assume that everyone here knows Jesus. Do you know for sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? I hope if you, if you don't know for certain, you can by the time you leave. You have to ask Christ in your life. Give your life to Him. It says in John chapter 1, verse 12, But to all who believed Him, believed Jesus, and accepted Him, He gave the right to become children of God. You have to accept Christ. You have to believe and accept Him. Hope you'll do that today if you haven't done it yet. Another thing I need to do, and this is talking to believers here, I need to give Jesus, give him quality time. I need, if, I, if I'm to constantly draw closer to him, I need to give him quality time. Mark 1.35. Before daybreak to the, ne the next morning, Jesus got up, went out to a long, isolated place to pray. This came in the heels of Jesus working like crazy the day before. I mean, he was healing people, casting out demons all into the night. It was crazy, crazy, crazy ministry time. And yet, even though he's no doubt very tired, he still made a point of getting up early the next day before anyone else got up so he can get along with his father. He didn't let his own business or other things deter, deter or even other people stop him from the most important thing, which was pressing in closer to Christ. He knew that he needed to draw closer to his Father. Because you see, the tighter I am with God, the brighter his love shines through me. If you're a believer, you need to do whatever it takes to spend quality time with Jesus. Every day. We love our spouses. No matter how long we marry, we still need to hang out with them. We need to have our date times with them. We need to have time just to talk with them. Because you know what? We connect. We, it's the connection that makes us tighter. And we don't want that to subside, right? So we invest in our time together. We spend quality time. We need to. Same thing with God. We need to have time. Quiet times are really important every single day, folks. It's the same way. We need to get tighter with God so we can be brightly shine His love uh, you know, through us. But that leads back to our main question today. How can we love Jesus, love like Jesus loves? We've already said we need to draw closer constantly to Him. We need to press into Him. Here's the second point. But in addition to that, you and I need to do something else. See, the, <clears throat> I need to let God love others through me. After I pressed in, after I let Him love me, then He can now love others through me. See, remember, the tighter I am with Christ the brighter his love will shine through me. Jesus said in John 15, 5, second part, those who remain in me, now if you have gotten tight with me, if you have let me love you and just hang tight with me, and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't do anything on your own, folks. Sometimes we get this, I don't know what it is. We think we can do this, and we can't. And anything we are able to do is because he already gave us that ability. But even then, it's going to be limited if we're not letting him do it through us. Well, how? How do we do that? How do I let God love others through me? That's the correct question, isn't it? How do I let Christ love others through me? I'm going to give you one key point. By surrendering to the control of the Holy Spirit. We've already talked about Galatians 5, 22 and 23 about the fruit of the Spirit. Let's look at the context of that. It says this. This is Galatians 5, 16, 17, and the first part of verse 22. It says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires to the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, etc. If we let the Holy Spirit take the reins and work through our lives, we will find that He will produce in us that love we cannot do on our own. I mentioned this week that Sherry took my... When, my, with my folks uh, to, <laughs> well, to Seattle. And, she, I, I, you know, she was supposed to come, well, she, flying back, she did that because she loves my parents. She had the week off, she did that for them. She's, that's the second year in a row she's done that. You say, well, that was love. And you say, well, yeah, well, she says family. You're right. 
It's family. But sometimes I start, do we not do for family like we should? Or, how much, okay, yes, family, but do we love others in the same way? And I can say with my wife, she does. She does. She's an she's a amazing person. I was told this week that Lonnie, you really married up. <laughs> I think they're right. <laughs> I've heard that all my life, my married life, because they're right. I thank the Lord for her every day. Love is selfless. It's always thinking of the other person. Sherry uh, was flying home. She was leaving fr uh, Saturday night. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me think this here. No, it was Friday night. Friday night, their time. Seattle, they're two hours after us. I'm trying to get the schedule here. And she was at the airport, and her flight got canceled. So she had to stay there the night at the Seattle airport. And then she woke up. The next day, she got a few hours sleep. Um, and, and, uh, and then her flight was delayed. The new flight. And delayed. And finally she got to where her layover was and then that flight coming here was delayed. So she didn't get until midnight last night. And so, but she was full of joy and, oh, it's okay, it's all good. That's my wife, she's, she's amazing. Love just overlooks those kinds of things. Jason Bonnickson is a pastor. He showed his congregation a special towel that he received when he was graduating from seminary. He loved that towel, and he, and he, and he commented about that in his towel and his, in his message. I'm going to read what he said to, about this towel to his church. He said this, One of the nearest, neatest gifts I've ever received was this little hand towel. I was given this during my seminary commencement and have cherished it ever since. The towel has a little saying on it, blessed to be a blessing. The pastor went on to say, I've kept it there, this towel in the back of his, behind his desk, he said, to serve as a reminder of God's calling on my life. And as I gazed upon this towel these last few days, I thought, yes, I am blessed, and for that I need to be a blessing to others. But more than this, he said, I'm also so loved by God, and because, because of that I'm loved by Him, I need, to love, I need to love others because of Him. For without the love of Christ, what does it mean to be a blessing anyway? He says, you know, in some ways I think it would be equally fitting if the towel read, loved to be loved. Or we could say, we need to let God love us and love others through us. The tighter I am with Christ, the brighter my love will shine. The tighter, the brighter. Let God love me so then he can love others through me. We're going to have our time of prayer right now. And here's my question for you. How are you doing in letting God love you? Really. In every aspect of your life. And then secondly, how are you doing in letting Him love others through you? Because you see, the two are connected. I can't love others the way I like if I'm not letting Him love me first. And that's a deep question. Let's pray. Father God, you're such an awesome God. You are the vine. We are the branches. We, apart from you, can do nothing. <laughs> but being tight with you, we bear much fruit, including love. Father God, I... I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that you would help us, Lord, to, to dare, to constantly dare to draw closer to you, to press in tight, to let you love us in every aspect of our lives and to not let things get in the way. And when we have, we ask your forgiveness and then we get rid of those barriers because nothing is worth that tight relationship with you. And then, Lord, thank you for being so gracious and so kind that, you, that you've given us your Holy Spirit so that when we do get tight with you, we let the Spirit take control and he can love others through us in a way better way than we can love them on our own.
Father, I want to pray for every one of us here this morning. Lord, we're all at different aspects and life can just hit at us in so many different ways. You understand that, Jesus. You were so busy and yet you, even in your busyness, you never sacrificed your time to press in with your Father. And Lord, but we've been guilty of maybe not being that way at times. Forgive us. Help us to value you enough and to value others enough to press into you like we should. I pray for us, Father God. Jesus, I pray right now, Lord, that you would take control. Friends, right now as we're praying together, I want you to do this. Maybe as we've been talking, Jesus has been sharing something with you. Maybe he's been telling you that, uh, yeah, there's something that you haven't gone to me all the way on. Or maybe you don't know yet, you just need to ask him, say, Lord, is there something I haven't, I haven't pressed in on you like I should? And I, I, I put up a barrier between you and me because of whatever reason. Or maybe I haven't trusted you. Or maybe I've let my pride get in the way. Or maybe I've just wanted to sin like I shouldn't. Forgive me, oh God. Help me with this, God. And now, Lord, I'm giving you this. And tell the Lord, let him reveal it to you. And then say, Lord, I want to give this to you now in Jesus' name. I don't want this to be a barrier between you and me anymore. God, I want to press in on you. I want to constantly remain in you. I want to constantly be tight with you, Lord. Because I know the tighter I am with you, Lord, the brighter my love will shine. Your love will shine through me. And I want that, God. I want to love others like you want me to love them. Help me with this, God. I give it to you right now in Jesus' name. We praise you in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen.